Hello and welcome this afternoon or this morning or this evening, wherever you may find yourselves as you are joining us today for the second session of Bishop Flores's reflection on John 14, St. Augustine and Synodality. Um, you should each have, uh, have shared with you um, a document. And before I forget, let me find that document and share it with you again. So give us a minute while everybody is filtering in and I will find that link for you. All right, so I'm going to put the link in the chat uh, for everyone who needs to access the document of Bishop Flores's. Well, now that everybody has kind of filtered in, let's pray and then I will put the chat um, in. So if you'll join me. Um, as we do all things here at the U.S. Senate team to join me just in a moment of prayer, remembering that we are always in the holy presence of God. In the name of the Father and the Son. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name, with you alone to guide us. Make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity, so that we may journey together to eternal life, and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you, for work in every place and time, in the communion of the Father and the Son, forever and ever. Amen. So, I, without further ado, I am going to introduce you to uh, Bishop Daniel Flores, the Bishop of the Diocese of Brownsville, as, where, as well as the Chairman on the Committee of Doctrine, and uh, the Bishop who has been shepherding the synodal, uh, the synodal path here in the United States. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Bishop Flores. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everyone, for taking a little time this afternoon. Um, this morning, wherever it happens to be. It's afternoon here in Texas, where I am, with a very southern tip. Um, and I'd like to kind of at least frame a little bit what I would hope to do, not just today, but then at our final session in a couple of weeks, uh, in the context of Christ the Way as a way of, of helping us to kind of appreciate the dimensions of, of synodality in terms of the way together. Um, what I see is 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 like last week, last time we met, I, I we kind of did a piece of track sixty nine where Augustine sort of opens up the question, "What does Jesus mean by saying I am the way?" and then uh, the truth and the life, and 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 kind of opening up that for him, this is this is part the part of the journey is being able to recognize how Christ Jesus is our way, um, because even Thomas the apostle didn't know how that was supposed to work. Uh, how can we know the way he, he says to Jesus and the Lord says, I am the way. And so, so Augustine, as you may recall, makes this point about, well, well, of course they knew the way because they knew Jesus, but then they didn't know how Jesus was the way. So that's an important question. I, I, I hope at the end, when we meet next time in a couple of weeks, we'll kind of put this together, but that's, I want us to keep that in mind that the part of, of, of our journey as, as members of the body of Christ is to enter more deeply into who Jesus is in the full dimension of the mystery. And that's, uh, it, it's it, in a certain way, it's kind of what St. Paul means when he says that, that if at one time we knew Christ only in the flesh, we now know him uh, in another way. And it's the other way of knowing Jesus in the full dimension of the mystery, which is, which is, which is very large. And that's part of what Augustine is sort of struggling with here. So that was kind of some of the things we did last week or a couple weeks ago. And, and now what I would like to do is, is, uh, is kind of put on the table using the text that I've, I've put together, um, uh, sort of two big sort of spaces, I could almost call them spaces, of how Augustine would want us to think about how Jesus is the way. And the first big space that we kind of opened up a little bit last time, and, and I'm going to continue a little bit this time, is, is, is what I would almost call, label it the mystical sacramental space 
of Jesus's uh, way for us. And so uh, as I go through some of the texts where he talks about how Jesus can be both both the way and the end and how does he come back to himself, which I'll admit is a, is a, is a bit of a complex series of words that he puts together. But if we kind of keep in mind that he's trying to talk about how we are inserted into Christ and it's the mystical way, mystical, not in the sense of, of, of necessarily like allegory, but it's the, it's the, it's the way of the mystery. It's the way of the, it's the way of the sacraments. Um, because remember, I think I mentioned it last time. If I didn't, I'll mention it this time. Uh, the word sacramentum and the word mysterion, I mean, mysterium in Latin, which come to us in English to mystery and sacrament, uh, are both translations of the same word in Greek. The same word in Greek is mysterion. And sometimes we in the Western church translate that mystery. And sometimes we translate that as sacramentum or sacrament, uh, which is interesting for us because it helps us to see there's a, there's a bigger dimension here. And what, what Augustine is going to do in, in the text we're going to look at for a little while today is kind of open up the sacramental dimension, the mysterious, the mystical dimension um, of, of, of belonging to Christ and being in him and as participating in him and being in the way. And then, God willing, and we have a little time, I'm going to move us uh, to, to kind of the second big area that I think uh, Augusta would want us to kind of struggle with. And that's from the text that I, I, got, I, I added to this time around from Tract 34, uh, where he talks what I, what I call the... Um, the discipleship uh, following Jesus dimension of, of the way that that's the more. And you'll notice in that part of it, when we get there, that Jesus is, I mean, St. Augustine is more often going to cite the synoptic gospels as giving us the example of how to follow Jesus. But the following of Jesus is based upon the mystical incorporation into Jesus. In other words, we can't follow him apart from participating in the grace of his life. That's why Augustine, if we ask ourselves the question, why does he spend so much time talking about how, how Jesus can, 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 can be both the way and the end and, and how he never left himself, even though he, anyway, that, those sorts of which we're going to get to. This is why, because the mystical incorporation into the person of the word made flesh is the basis for our following him in the synoptic sense of, of, um, of sell everything you have and give to the poor. It, it, because it's the grace of it all, uh, because we can't do this on our own. Remember, Augustine is a great opponent of Pelagianism, and Pelagianism tends to think that if we just try hard enough, we can be we can be really, really good. And Augustine's going to tell us, you, you know, that's really not enough. You really have to participate in the grace that Jesus gives you to follow him. And that's the mystical that makes the basis for the discipleship. So that's to kind of set you up where we're going. And then, and then, so, so if you look at that, at the text. By the way, the text that I'm giving you today is kind of a continuation of what I gave the last time. You put them all together, the one from last time and the one this time, and you basically have all of the texts that I'm going to talk about between now and the end in a couple of weeks. So you'll at least you'll have the text of Augustine, uh, which is always good to meditate on, let me say. It's always good. Um, so anyway, so if you look at, at kind of the first page of what we're talking about today, um, I, I just like to note on number three of of of, of Tractate sixty nine, uh, where where Augustine uh, basically addresses the Lord Jesus directly. He's remember he's preaching. This is a liturgical assembly, and he's got his people in front of him, and and he's and he he's talking to them. But then he stops in the middle of it and he addresses the Lord directly. Uh, th this is very typical of Augustine, and actually I find this very edifying, um, uh, because it's uh, it's like it's it's natural for Augustine to kind of turn and talk to the Lord directly. Uh, it's a it's a, it's a kind of a sign of the intimacy of his how he how close he senses the Lord is to this assembly and that he can be addressed directly and so so he's about to set it up to kind of talk about about the kenosis of Jesus and how it is that he is the way um, and that he in a certain way he comes back to himself in the resurrection and so he says tell me Lord what I will say to your servants the servants of the people in front of him my fellow servants because I'm a servant with them. For the Apostle Thomas had you before him so he could ask you. You see, he's referring back to the gospel. Thomas says, how, how, how can we know the way? And he asked him in, in person. However, he would not understand you if he did not have you in him. And I, I want to underline this. Uh, if he did not have you in him. Understanding Jesus is not about necessarily being physically proximate to him. Understanding him is also having him within you. And this is the this is what you find when Jesus when 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 the epistles of Saint John speak about 
abiding in Jesus and Jesus abides in us. Because the abiding language of the Johannine Gospels and the epistles is the language of the Holy Spirit. That's how is Jesus in us and how are we in Jesus, except that is the way the Spirit unites us. And that's essentially tied to being sacramentally united to Christ because it's the work of the Spirit. But what, what Augustine wants us to understand is that, is that, is that the understanding of the, of, the, of the mystery of Jesus and its dimensions is, is dependent in a certain way as to having him within us. It's the indwelling what the later theologians will call the indwelling of the Holy Spirit by which the, the Lord himself is within us. That's why he says, even Thomas would not have understood you if he did not have you inside of him. Uh, that's the grace of illumination, which comes from the Holy Spirit that is present in us. This is something I, I honestly think we all need to pray for a lot. <laughs> when we think about the spirituality of synodality, which really is the spirituality of the, of the great tradition, is it shouldn't be different from that. It is it is it is praying that the that that the Lord be in us and we in Him and that we understand by participating that the mystery of Christ is not something you understand only by reading about it. It's a participation in the life of Jesus. That's how He is in us. So He makes that point, and so He continues. I question you because I know that you, Lord, are above me. That is, He's no longer physically present, like in the way that Thomas the Apostle had Him. He's ascended. Now I ask that to the extent I can, I pour out my soul above me. I want to put my soul up to where you are. Uh, where, though you make not a sound, I can still listen to you teaching. This is a beautiful line. Because, because he has the text. Uh, but it, it, and Augustine is very attuned to the fact that, that Thomas had the, the, the apostle had the privilege of hearing Jesus' voice. And, and, and perhaps we may lament we, didn't, we don't hear it. But, 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 but we do... We can listen, right? We can listen, even though he make not a sound, because the resonance is within. That's the listening. It's the listening of the heart that Augustine is talking about. So though you make not a sound, I can still listen to your teaching. And it's all about listening to what Jesus has to say, which is an interior act. So he repeats the question. This is the great question that he's at the center of Tractate 69. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Please tell me, how do you go to yourself? Now, where does this question come from? Uh, Inasmuch as Jesus is the way, he's moving. He's going somewhere. Lord, we don't know the way. Yes, you do. Follow me. Uh, but inasmuch as he's the truth and the life, he is the destination. Uh, that is the finality of our journey. And so, and so how do you go, you who are the word? How do you go to yourself? How do you go? How? This is a question. You say, well, that's that's an odd question. Well, st stick with him here. Are we to think that you, in order to come to us, you abandon yourself? This is a key crystal Christological question, and, and I, I won't go into all of the detail, but the, but the point is that the, all, of the, all of the teachings of the early Christological councils and, and the fathers of the church is very... God became one of us without cease, ceasing to be God. That without ceasing to be, he didn't completely abandon his personhood. Rather, his personhood, which is the person of the word, became one of us. And he doesn't lose his, he doesn't cease being the end when by becoming one of us, he becomes the way. This is, this is, uh, and sometimes you just need to kind of just accept that. It's a great mystery, but he doesn't cease being God when he becomes one of us. This is, this is classic patristic Christology. Um, and, and that's why he's saying this. Are we to think that in order to come to us, you abandon yourself? Did you cease to be God? No. Especially because you came not to your own, but because the Father sent you. And then he continues. I'm jumping over my notes there. I know certainly that you emptied yourself. That's the Pauline language, you know, the kenosis, the emptying, which, the, which Augustine interprets primarily as the emptying of the word into, into, uh, into human nature, he he continues to be the word, but he's in the flesh of his. So, uh, you emptied yourself, but because you assumed the form of a slave, not because you left the form of God. See, there it is. Not because you left the form of God, to which you returned, nor because you lost what you had recovered at the resurrection. For example, it's not like you lost being God, um, and yet you came and reached not only the eyes of the flesh, but also the truly you truly arrived 
into the hands of men, but how else but in the flesh? And when he talks about the hands of men, he mean he was grabbed, his flesh was grabbed, and he was arrested, and he was taken to the cross. This is what he means. Jesus is 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 tactically available to us, and that's what happened to him. So I just want to emphasize that this kind of governs the whole of this movement that he's going to talk about in the next in the next couple of passages. Um, that that kind of establishes how he can be made both way and end for us. And the way is the way of his flesh is is lived out in the journey of time. And if we are in that flesh mystically, we could say, uh, sacramentally joined to him by baptism, you know, chrismation and the Eucharist especially, which is the summit of the all the sacraments tend to that, to the Eucharistic sacrifice, the reason the receiving of the flesh of Jesus is how Jesus is in us and how we are in him. This is the mystical incorporation. This is the this is the grace which no one can merit. It's simply given to us, but to those who are called. And this is what why being in his flesh allows us to go with him so that we can be with him in the finality of his of his of his of his Godhead united to the Father and to the Spirit. That's kind of where the mystical way is. So let's just stop a second. Stop a second. Uh, this is all about being mystically incorporated, sacramentally incorporated into the body of Christ, which he has because he took flesh. That is why he is our way, because our flesh meets his flesh. Our flesh receives his flesh. He is in us, and in, 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 it's the it's the it's the it's the link, it's the linchpin between that allows us to move with him. In some in some way, you could say by becoming flesh, the word determines that he wants to move, so that we can move with him. Where does he want to go? He wants to go to the to the to the words, union with the Son and with the Spirit and the Father, which he never loses, because that's why he can take us there, and because he knows the way, he is the way. That's you know you you end up speaking in tautologies when you do this, but I, I, it's just important, and, and then it helps us, as I say, as we get to the second big part that I want to talk to you about, which is the what I would almost, you know, almost call the synoptic way. This is very Johannine. Um, obviously, he's commenting on Saint John. Uh, Saint John has a, you know, has a different. In the Father's all thought, he had a very high mystical sense of the, of the mystery of, of Jesus, and so he leads us into that. So, so let's just think about this for just a minute. Uh, th this this issue of of being incorporated into the body of Christ. And how it it's a, it's it's our condition on the way. This is this is how we can move with him, and how he can move with us. It's the grace that's granted, and it's and it's a, and it's a real participation in his life. Now, the spirit, and I, I want to emphasize this: the spirit is intimately involved in this whole incorporation. It is the spirit that moves us to to be incorporated into Christ. It's the spirit that moves us um, uh, to. Uh, to enter and understand the depth of the mystery of his love, which is ultimately what he reveals to us. And so there's, it's so closely related. The, 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 the pneumatology of Augustine is so closely related to the, to being, to being connected to Christ. That's the, you could almost say that for Augustine, that's the principal work of the spirit. If we enter into the depth of Jesus, it is because the spirit gives us the light. If we can love in the way of Jesus is love, then we, it's because the spirit gives us the love. If we can understand the way, of Jesus's cross, if we can understand the way of his of his of his self emptying, it is because the Spirit has led us to this. The Spirit, in in that sense, is all saturates these things that Augustine talks about, and is 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 the is the means by which we are we are incorporated into Christ, the new the new Adam. I, I want to pause here. I mentioned it was in my notes last week or two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I don't remember now, it was Ash Wednesday, I think. Um, I mentioned Catherine of Siena, and I want to go back to that. Um, you know, Augustine's influence on how the church in the West, I mean, this is one dimension, it's not the only way of understanding the mystery of Christ, but Augustine has has tremendous weight in the West just by the, by the way the tradition developed. But, 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 but there are two instances where you can kind of see that in the later tradition, where this, this impetus or this, this, this way Augustine formulates you know incorporation into christ uh as the way his flesh is the is the is, is what we're incorporated so that we can walk walk with him and him and us um one of them is catholic catherine of siena and her, her dialogue 
the the dialogue of Catherine of Siena, which which is which is uh, early thirteenth century, actually fourteenth century, um, uses the image of Jesus the bridge, and the, it's the it's a mystical image of of, of the bridge that, that starts on earth and, and takes you to heaven. The bridge is the flesh of Christ. I mean, it's literally the the way it's what we walk over and through to get to the destination which is the which is the which is the, the final kingdom um and and it's his it's it's his it's his it's his flesh that it, that 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 we walk it, it so the image is deeply augustinian for catherine of siena uh and so all of what she talks about in her dialogue with jesus is about how he is you know the the way for us uh to the the fullness of the kingdom, the, the, the heavenly kingdom, and it's and it's a, but it's a, it's a literal walking along the, the bridge that crosses that crosses us over to the next place. It's it's it is the transitus. It's like it is the Paschal mystery. I mean, to put it another way, because the Paschal mystery is crossing over, and we're united to His flesh in the crossing over, and we remain in the flesh in the fullness of the kingdom, just like Jesus continues to be in the fullness of His in His flesh at the right hand of the Father. He is the Word, but He's in His flesh, and we shall be in the flesh. In the fullness of the kingdom, this, this, this is part. So, so it's you could say that 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 uh, that Catherine of Siena could provide a a commentary, so to speak, on this vision of us being incorporated into Christ and moving with Him in the mystical, sacramental participation of the Church in Him. Okay, second point I want to make about that participation of the Church in Him. This is an ecclesial reality. It's not just me and Jesus, and I'm going to walk along this way because he's taking me along. Uh, it, it's it's a fully ecclesial reality. The body of the church is incorporated into Christ, and the church uh, has. There's a lot of ways we could. And the Second Vatican Council gives a lot of ways images that are very important. But the church is sort of understood uh, in a number of, of of images, and uh, and 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 one of them, of course, is the body of Christ. Um, uh, I was listening to a talk by Cardinal Grech the other, the other day, and, and, and he points out that in Lumen Gentium, there's also the image of um, the people of God, and there's also the image of the uh, of the temple of the Holy Spirit, and they are fruitfully looked at together. What I'm what I'm saying here is that the 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 the, 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 the lynch pin, the, the 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 center point is the mediating point is the body of Christ because it's the accessible part. We're incorporated in that, and that's how we become the body. I mean, the the, the temple of the spirit, um, because the temple dwell, he dwells in us, and and the people of God in the in, in, incorporated in, in, into the new law. So I want to I want to emphasize this is not the only way to look at Christology and ecclesiology together, but it is it is a powerful way, and it's deeply Pauline. In the end, it's deeply Pauline. All these things about the body of Christ, and. Um, so just to kind of point out something, because the other sort of point of the tradition where Augustine's influence on helping us understand mystical incorporation is St. Thomas. And you may be interested to know, many of you may already know this, but St. Thomas in the Summa does not have a particular question on the church. He doesn't ask, what is the church? Or who is the church? Or, or uh, there's only one article in the entire Summa where Jesus, wh wh rather where St. Thomas talks about, about the, the church in a, in a very specific way. And that's in article eight of the third part. And it's the article about Christ the head. And it's in the Christology treatise. It's about Christ. And then he talks about the body because the body makes no sense to talk about the body if you're not going to talk about the head. So the article is about Christ the head and the grace of the head that gives life to the body. And so it's a, it's a beautiful article um, but, and questions, a question in the, in the articles. And it's a beautiful one, but it just gives you an idea. This is a for, for this tradition of Augustine and that, that runs through the Middle Ages, uh, through the monks and then through through St. Thomas and others and Catherine of Siena, uh, the church is understood as a, as, as the, as uh, principally as the body and Christ is the head. And again, that's, that's not the only way, but it's, a, it's, it's a way that cannot be left out when we talk about the mystery of the church. One thing about a mystery is you have to look at it from different pr perspectives and different dimensions and the images are not purely metaphorical or not purely sort of poetic, but they, they have flesh and blood to them. And that's why the image of Christ as the head uh, and the church as the body. So for St. Thomas, uh, and, and also I think for Catherine of Siena, and I think for Augustine, I think they're faithful to Augustine in this, 
Um, the um, uh, uh, ecclesiology is an aspect of Christology. I would put it that way. Ecclesiology is an aspect of Christology. For them, it doesn't make it. Does, it's not really helpful to speak of the church too much without talking about Christ the head, because all the grace comes from Him. He's the one who makes us who we are. If we are mystically incorporated in Him, I want to emphasize for Augustine, this issue of being incorporated is sacramental. It is. It is the. It is the baptismal uh, grace by which we are made members of His body. It's the. It's the. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the grace of the spirit that comes in chrismation or confirmation that, that, that empowers us to be participants in his mission. And it is the Eucharistic living of that crucified and risen flesh in our own flesh that gets us, it propels us. And it's the propelling, it's the propelling uh, that is important because that's the whole thing about the way you kind of move along. So, uh, so as not to tarry, <laughs> which I already have, um, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, I want to aim us towards uh, Tractate 34, uh, but before I get there, um, uh, I just want to just, I just want to read aloud, because I think it's helpful to read aloud. I think it's, I read scripture aloud to myself, people may think I'm a little odd that way, but it's good for it to hit the ear. So, so, um, so I just want to read from page three, just this text, um, where he's talking to Jesus again, um, he says, uh, through this you came to us, although you remained where you were, that is, in the glory of the Father. Through this you returned without ever leaving the place where you had come, that is, he stayed, he's always with the Father. The Father is with me, he says in John. If then, through this, you came and returned, you see, it's the moving thing that's, the, that's at issue here. You came and returned through this, without a doubt, you are not only for us the way by which we came to you, but you were also for you the way. That is, he he lived, he died, and he rose. He he, he is the way for himself. This this this, this is actually quite quite touching. Um, uh, on the other hand, when you went to life, which is you in yourself, you actually led that same flesh of yours from death to life. See, it, it's the literalism of his flesh. That same flesh of yours from death to life. In effect, God the Word is one thing; man is the other. That is human nature of flesh. But the word became flesh. That is, he became one of us. He became man. He became human. Thus, there is, this is key Christology. There is not one person of the word and another person of the man. No. No. That's the storyism. There is one person. And it is the word in the flesh. It's the person of the word who has chosen to live the flesh that we could be incorporated into him. His flesh is the hand of God reaching down to us to pick us up. And therefore, because each of the two is Christ to the one person, this is this this is remarkable sort of a, a exposition of 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 a patristic Christology. Because of the two is Christ. Each of the two is Christ, the one person, the person of the Word. I used to teach in the seminary, and I used to tell the seminarians when they were taking Christology, if I ever hear you preach in the pulpit that Jesus is 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 two persons, I personally will come. And, uh, and rend my garments in front of your congregation, because that is not the faith of the church. One person in two natures. This is very important. It's the person of the word who takes flesh that we might be incorporated into his flesh and therefore participate in the word. This is it. This is the mystical side. You might say, well, this is kind of heavy, Bishop. Well, it is. Uh, but hey, Augustus is talking to folks at Hippo, so he can talk to us. Um, and so it, we may, you know, it's a lot of centuries, but words are words and they mean things. So when the flesh was buried, Christ was buried, Augustine says. So in fact, we believe with the heart unto righteousness, and so we confess with the mouth unto salvation, Romans 10. In the same way, when the flesh came from death to life, Christ came to life. And because Christ is the word of God, Christ is the life. That's the end. The risen Christ takes us to the Father. Do not touch me, he says to Mary Magdalene. I have not yet ascended to my Father. Okay. Meditate that. It's just, it's just, it's just a beautiful thing. Um, you, you know, Spirituality, in its deepest sense, is something that's deeply tied to the to the fundamental expressions of the faith of the church, and doctrine is important to kind of relate to Jesus in the best way. So I have a few minutes before I take questions, but I want to move us on to Tractate Thirty Four. And you say, "Well, Bishop, you're moving us backwards here." Well, no, it's just God, John has different things to say, and Augustine takes the liberty of commenting on anything he wants wherever he wants. That's just the liberty of the preacher. So in the middle of, of, of Tractate 34, which is actually on John 8, number 8, 8, 12, 
uh, whoever follows me will have the light of life and will not walk in darkness. That's a different passage, but it's related to the way. That's why you will notice uh, if, as you read the whole thing and you can read it um, you know, later on the whole thing, uh, he does invoke the at this key point where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Because what's the point of walking in light if you don't know where you're walking? Light and the way are intimately related, which is why he feels free to put those together. But what I would like for us to look at, and I want to read it here because it's quite, 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 quite beautiful, is, is that on the top of page five, where he says, a certain man, let's see, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, uh, let me let me set this up a little bit. I I, I, I I chose this passage because it helps us to see that for Augustine, you know, it's not just all about what John says. It's also about what what the synoptic gospels who have a, that have a tremendous value in their own uh, to help us understand uh, the, the 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 discipleship, the following of Jesus in a more in a more, uh, I guess, a more practical sense. Uh, for lack of a better word, is is uh, which is what the synoptic gospels very often sort of narrate for us, is they're not separated. Uh, we walk the way of Jesus. We say we respond to him when he says, "Follow me," precisely because he gives us a certain grace that leads us to incorporation. So, I want to read this because here he's, he's he's kind of invoking the the, the 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 gospel passages from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So a certain man heard this. I mean, follow me. I mean, he heard the you know follow me of Jesus. And he's and so he's going to cite Matthew 19. Uh, so a certain man heard this go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Okay, this is all about Jesus the way because following Jesus is following along the way, and and, and but it's 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 less the mystical dimension focused here as as you must call the, the moral discipleship dimension. What does this mean for me? What must I change? to be in the way and participate the way of Christ, because it is about a change. And, uh, and Tractate 34 is all about the change that goes on inside of us because we are along the way. Uh, and it's in us. It's the church being called to conversion, right? This is this is not just a, a, an individual thing. It's the church being called to conversion, that this, this sort of, the conversion is based upon the grace being offered to participate in the flesh of Jesus. So he says, the man heard this, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Notice this is a very important passage for Augustine. It was for all of the fathers. The, the care of the poor is not a footnote to the gospel. The fathers took it very seriously because it's at the center of the way Jesus talks about what it means to follow him and to be a part of him. And then Jesus, and then Augustine says, but he went away sad. We all know this passage. He did not follow him. He couldn't. He decided not to. He sought the good teacher. This is Augustine's rhetoric. He sought the good teacher, addressed him as doctor or teacher, and yet despised what he taught. That is to say, he, he went and asked Jesus the question. He just didn't like the answer. He left sad. And, and note how Augustine talks about this. He left sad, chained by his greed. Uh, Augustine thinks greed is a very deep problem. And it's not just a modern problem. It's an ancient problem. It's wanting It's wanting more and more of what this world has to offer you. It's not just money greed. It's things greed. He left sad, chained by his greed. He left sad because he had a, a great burden of greed on his shoulders. From the Christian point of view, the burden is, is all these things that keep us from being free to follow Christ and to give up everything and to, and to follow him and to, and, to, and, to, and to go along the way. The burden that is preventing him is exactly the burden of his greed. That is, this man, he became weary. He became distraught. And regarding the one who wanted to unload the burden from him, Jesus was offering him how to get this burden off so he could move along the way. He thought that he should not follow him, but rather he deserted him. This, this example, I just think it's a, it's a beautiful sort of, it puts us back into the, our feet back into the ground. The mystical life is going to be a literal following of Jesus in, in being freed from the burden that our own sin and that our own weakness and that our own greed and our own sort of, sort of self-imposed, sort of like preoccupations uh, prevent us from doing. So and I want us to see these things together because, because we can't separate the discipleship life of every day from the mystical incorporation into the mystery of Jesus. This is the way of the church. We're called, we're called to, to cultivate our mystical union with Christ through the sacramental life and, 
and prayer and, and the reading of scripture, but also we're called to a practical daily giving up of the greed or whatever else is 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 shackling us from being truly free. And it's not a one-time thing and then it's over. It's a daily overcoming that only happens because Christ is operating in us by the grace of the Holy Spirit. That's how we overcome any of those things that really do burden us. So let's go on with this passage. In another place, the Lord cried out in the gospel, Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek, meek and lowly of heart. That's Matthew 11. How many hearing the gospel did what the rich man did not do? He's going to keep emphasizing this. When they heard this from the master's mouth, and it's, then he exhorts his people, let us do this then, right now. Like right now. If we don't do this now, then, then what's the point? Uh, let us follow the Lord. Let us break the shackles that prevent us from following him. This is along the way. Christ is the way. And who is qualified to loosen such bonds? If not the one to whom it is said, you broke my chains. That's Psalm 115. About whom another Psalm says, the Lord re releases those who are chained. He lifts up those who are crushed. Notice Augustine uh, cites the Psalms a lot. Uh, I think the longest work Augustine ever wrote was his commentary on the Psalms. It's volumes and volumes. Um, but but it also lets you know that he has he has great facility with Scripture. He knows it well, and he he wants his people to know it well. That's why he he talks about it. So before we finish and I take up questions, I want to move on to number nine because it's a beautiful passage. We'll talk about it in more detail next week, next time. But but you keep reading on page five. And those who are released and upright, that is to say they're, they're upright because they're not shackled. That is to say they're not, they're not bowed over because of the burden of greed or, or anything else. And, and they are released. That is their bonds, their chains are taken up. What do they follow if not the light from whom they hear? I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness. That's a Joe 9 passage. For the Lord illuminates the blind. And here he's talking about the sacraments. We are therefore enlightened now, for we have the eye solve of faith. The eye solve of faith. That's a great, there's a particular Latin word which I which escapes me right now, which is the stuff you put in your eyes to make them better. Um, and faith is that. Remember at baptism, the, the deacon or the priest says, What do you ask of Holy Mother Church? Faith. Or baptism. They have a number of answers we can get to that, but that was the since this saliva, you see, he, Augustine loves the earthy image. Since his saliva was earlier mixed with earth to anoint the one who was born blind, John 9, 6, we too were born blind from Adam, and we need him to enlighten us. He mixed saliva with earth. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He mixed saliva with earth. Therefore, it was predicted the truth has sprung up from the earth. Whenever you hear Augustine or the fathers like him talk about enlightenment and about the, the way Jesus took mud and put it in people's eyes, that's the sacramental life of the church that's being alluded to there. And he's talking about the fact that the faith opens our eyes to the mystery of Jesus so that we can follow him. But the opening of the eyes is a movement towards the truth of Jesus that is meant to move our hearts to love of Jesus because only love will make us move. Only understanding can help you in some ways, a lot of ways, but but it, it the understanding of the faith is meant to help you help us move as a body, as a church, along the way of Christ, which is the way, um, which is the way of the incarnation. So notice when he talks about uh, he mixed saliva with earth. You see, this is this 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 is you know the mixing saliva and earth. That's what heals, and that's the incarnation. That's an image for him of the incarnation. God became flesh. The word becomes one of us anyway finishing up that passage i have a little asterisk there to come and this is where i want to wrap up before we go into questions i just want to read that next part for his part the lord said to him himself said to us i am the way the truth and the life we will enjoy the truth when we see him face to face because this too is promised to us in fact who would dare to expect what god has not deigned to promise or give we will see face to face this is the promise so this is the part in 34 where he kind of explicates more I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
I know I've talked real fast. I'm sorry, but I'm going to stop here and see if we have any reflections or comments or questions before uh, before uh, before time gets completely away from me. It's now 2.40, at least here in Texas. And thank you very much. Thank you, Bishop Flores. And thank you for regulating time yourself this afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. Before we get into the questions, let's just take a moment, um, a minute of silence to really reflect on everything that Bishop Flores has shared with us, as well as what Augustine has shared with us this afternoon. So we'll take a minute and then we'll get into Q&A, which is open. So as it comes to you, please share. All right, Bishop Flores, are you are you ready? Okay. Do the best I can. Um, some really great reflective questions. So one of the questions that has come in is just asking if you could comment more um, on the conversion of the church as it relates to these passages. And as you know, uh, with us in some, it's, it's talked about sometimes as a conversion of the people of God. Um, yeah. So wondering if you have any thoughts or comments about the conversion of the church in general, perhaps. <clears throat> version of the church at this moment right yes i i think i think that's a very wide and, and deep question but I, I would i would begin to look at it in, in, in this, this way augustine would advise us um that the, the church is always in the process of deeper conversion and it's always rooted in familiarity with the way of christ and notice how augustine moved from the joanine gospel to kind of help us appreciate sort of the metaphysics uh the mystical metaphysics of being united to christ into the synoptics um, because the synoptics have a key role here. That is all of us. I mean, if the church is going to be living a deeper conversion, then we have to hold up our lives as individuals and as local communities and as, as, as a world church in different parts of the world to the light of the, of the very plain things Jesus says about what it means to follow him. And that's mostly going to be found in the, in the, in the teaching of the synoptics, you know, uh, that is the love for the poor. That is the the, the 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 compassion for those who are outcast, uh, the touching of the lepers, uh, all these things, uh, the self forgetfulness, the kenosis that Saint Paul talks about. In other words, the path of conversion that the church we have to hear it is always going to take you back to to the words of Jesus Himself and His example, because the words of Jesus without His example don't always make a lot of sense. That is to say, they're meant to go together. It's the example of Christ. It's his selflessness. It's what the Holy Father calls el estilo de Jesus, the style of Jesus. All of that is the content of our conversion. But unless we're looking at the face of Jesus with the aid of the Holy Spirit and the way of Jesus and how he acts, Jesus moves through history. I mean, he lives through a one single lifetime and he works and he shows us what the way is. We really, and I think this in our parishes, you know, in our dioceses, and it because the church is local i mean we can't do this like 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 in the abstract but we really need to kind of be much more serious about 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 a communal reflection upon what the gospel is calling us to change in our witness and it's a question uh and so in addition to the synodal listening sessions listening in the spirit i think part of the listening in the spirit is exactly to ask the holy spirit as you read the gospel together what is it that jesus is showing us that is not as present in my life of conversion as it should be. And just be honest, let him, Augustine had great confidence. Jesus will answer you if you ask him those kinds of questions. In, in a, it's just a great confidence. I think, um, you know, this has always been the way of the church with regard to conversion. I, I'm reminded of St. Francis of Assisi, who, who was very strict with his, with his brothers 
and 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 sisters to tell them, you know, don't gloss over the gospel too much. Don't comment it so much that people lose. Stick with what Jesus says because it's not rocket science. Well, he didn't say rocket science, but I do. It's not. You know, Jesus speaks forthrightly, and we shouldn't try to explain it away. There was a great fear in Saint Francis, also Saint Dominic, of the over glossing of the gospel. We sort of we kind of spruce it up in a way to make it sound differently than what Jesus is really talking about. When he says, when he says, you know, forgive your 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 your, your brother seventy times, seven times. There's a there's a profound call there to a kind of reconciliation, and we just need to kind of allow ourselves in local communities to be to be challenged by just the plain sense of what Jesus says, and including the parables. The parable of the Good Samaritan, which the Holy Father constantly is, is as I believe in the Holy Father says, is the parable for our time. Not the only one, obviously, but the good, but so is the so is the prodigal son, um, especially with that son, the older son who doesn't want to come back into the house. There's a there's a lesson there for us, for resentments that we, okay, I could go on, but I think that's the call, that 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 nothing should keep us from from engaging in Jesus himself and what he says conversion is supposed to look like, because that's the way for the church by the spirit. There is no other. I think in your answer, you answered about three other questions that we oh. had coming in, uh, which is great. So I'm going to try uh, to connect them a little bit. Um, you know, we're talking about Jesus and being honest and truthful about how Jesus is calling us to conversion. Uh, someone wrote in about this per our personal processes of conversion and and calling um, our attention to living the gospel as Christ preaches is uh, also it confronts tensions and opposites, which is something we've been uh, engaging with and experiencing throughout the synodal process. Um, and so sometimes it's challenging and painful. And so uh, the question is kind of how do you see the church as a whole as we've been undertaking this process of confronting tensions and opposite and uh, opposites and and the pain that has come within this process as well. Yeah, and this is very. Uh... Uh, I, I think one of the challenges for us is that is that we we um, it's hard for us to imagine a way to be to uh, to 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 disagree that doesn't end up being very sort of uh, into an argument and, and and that's the church sort of has has a way if we do it right uh, to kind of to kind of hear each other out and because we recognize that the bond that holds us together the sacramental bond the mystical bond is deeper than what our minds are trying to figure out about how best to do this issue or that issue in the church. If we start from that basic communion, um, then it, then it makes it possible. The tension, I mean, the apostles, I mean, you go back and we, anytime you read the letters of St. Paul or the Acts of the Apostles, the tensions were there, but it didn't break the communion. This is, this is the thing. Um, secondly, uh, I, I'm, I am going to talk about this in the, in the final session on the 19th, because of St. Joseph, uh, it's the last part of 34. It's a, and I would encourage you to read it before then. It, it talks about why am I so upset when I have to correct so many people? It's a, it's a beautiful passage, ultimately about communion. And why am I not at peace? And it's a, it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it starts on in number 10. And I, I want to spend some time with it because he's talking about every time I'm in a dialogue with somebody else and we end up being disagreeable. And he's talking about this. Oh, why does it disturb my peace? So, and he ends up, taking us to a point of that's my that's that's how I need to be called to deeper conversion because there's also there's also a tension inside of me and this is this is classic Augustine self-reflection our tensions outside of ourselves are real but they're often merely or not merely but also reflections of tensions that are in each of us the struggles that we are trying so I would encourage you to look at that and I would hope to talk about it more because I think I think there's something profoundly yearning in Augustine for a church that can live in concord. And his time were his times were quite rambunctious. Um, and there was, you know, there were there was a neighboring church across the street of Donatists who didn't who were who were condemning, you know, the Catholics for being and they were neighbors. Um, and and so so I think that's part of what we want to look at a lot. But but I do think the tension is real. Uh, but it need not be the source of of of, of discord, which is a different thing, uh, and it need not be a source of um, of breaking up the 
the communion of the thing, um, because we we can afford to recognize that we have limited perspectives, each one of us. And, you know, we we take these. See, the thing is, the faith is a, it's a good thing. It incites great passion in us because we love it. We care for this. And it bothers us when somebody looks at it differently. But that's a certain humility, you know, is about, well, I don't see everything. And I can learn from how somebody else sees it. That's an attitudinal thing. Let your mind be like the mind of Christ. Let your attitude be the attitude of Christ who humbled himself, you know, and that's 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 back to the discipleship who humbled himself uh, and took the form of a servant. That takes us back to how you hear and how you walk, uh, despite the fact that we, we are quite different. So at least that's a tentative answer, and I do want to kind of move a little bit more into that the next session we have and to look at that section on Concord and why am I so upset all the time? I guess to ask that question. It's a good, it's a real question for us too. So it's good. Thank you for that. Just kind of what you just said about uh, the personal attitudes and reflections and um, our own ability to be self-aware and to also self-reflect um, as you mentioned that Augustine was doing. Um, do you have any, and we kind of asked this last time of you, uh, tips or tricks or um, ways or attitudes to help, you know, other ordinary Catholics reflect more deeply on, on this call uh, to conversion that Jesus is offering to us? Yeah, you know, uh, I do think personal meditation on the gospel is important, but I also think in, in, in this, I think the synodal, synodal path that we've been talking about for the last couple of years offers us a great opportunity here uh and that is to to form small smaller groups it may be in our parishes or our, our mission chapels of, of of interested individuals who can read the gospel together because there we learn you know it, it, and and to do some preparation i mean it's not just it's just whatever occurs to our head but you know to kind of try to read it in the context of of of, of the life of the church and and kind of the church's understanding of of the person of jesus and so forth but because if we if we meditate together and share what you hear in Jesus's words here um, in a small group, what you're seeing is that there's a richness in the diversity of perspective. And if we're only talking to Jesus ourselves, then we might miss that. Um, and that and that other people can help us to get a more broad, a, a more complete image as to what Jesus is calling us to in conversion and can be challenging to us. And to learn, sometimes I think this is important. When somebody says something challenging, say you have a small prayer group and you do do meditation, say you're going to meditate on the Gospel of Mark this year because this is year B and we're reading Mark, which is a great thing to do. And you're going to meet, you know, once every, you know, every every uh, every week at some point, you're going to meet and, and just do, do the, you know, read something aloud. I think it has to go through the ears as well as through the brain. And then, and then have some silence. Um, let the words penetrate more deeply. Uh, and then talk about it, but 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 it's not necessary to respond, you know, in a full full sort of discourse to what somebody else said. It's good to let it just sit with you. We need to. I think that's part of it. Uh, things that people have so said to me in different groups or over the years that that I just took home and I just sat with me for a while, and it's been very enriching. You just remember, and because not necessarily the first thing that you hear. Does it strike you in the full depth of what it is? And so after somebody here should just say, thank you. And I need to think about that, especially if they say something challenging. You know, suppose you have a, suppose you have a, a small, you know, uh, gospel group uh, that's, that's sort of reading the gospel of Mark this year. And you're, you're, you're at certain passages when Jesus, you know, Jesus multiplies the loaves and he says to the disciples, you know, give them something to eat yourselves. And, you, and somebody asks you, well, when do we ever do that? When do we ever do what Jesus says when he says, gives them something to eat yourselves? <laughs> Maybe it's a challenging question, but it's a question worth sitting with. Um, and not glossing over. Well, that was back in those days. Now we have, <coughs> now we have <coughs> social security. No, there are people right in front of us and we need to figure it out how to follow Jesus with them. So there it is. Uh -huh. I'm definitely going to leave you with a softball question um, that I think it is important for us to, to think about too. And so uh, they wrote in and said that, and I too really appreciated this image of movement along the way, that mm -hmm. movement um, as well. 
uh, which all, which implies, right, that we haven't arrived, nor is this journey complete. Um, but often in the discourse, particularly around the synod, uh, this idea of finality or things not being able to change and how to to bring those two into conversation. The fact that we are along the way, um, but also this uh, kind of idea too that nothing can change. Right. You know, uh, this is a this is a great sort of perspectival question. I I think um, I think circumstances, realities change whether we want to stop them or not. And, and part of our being along the way with Jesus, the movement with him, is to is to is in one way to kind of enter more deeply into how Jesus in us responds to the challenge of a changing time. And that that's a question, and and Jesus in us wishes us to respond in a way that is that is fully in him and fully present to the world because that's the mystery of the incarnation uh god jesus is truly the word he is in himself uh the word in the flesh but he's truly present to us and this is the the great challenge it's not easy even to conceptualize but but to be on the way is to accept the fact that we have to be able to kind of for lack of a better word translate the mystery of jesus in our own flesh to the world around us in this world that is that that you know is is changing even as we speak in terms of just you know things never are, are, are the same the finality i would say it is about movement but 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 augustine and john himself the apostle would have us realize that the movement is towards and in christ and that and that that's the work of the spirit to lead us along that way and that not to lose sight uh, and perhaps we could meditate a little bit upon because I spent so much time on the word "the way," uh, on the truth and the life, which is the finality of of the of the journey with Jesus, the truth of the life, the truth, and it's in my notes there. I didn't talk about this a lot, but the truth and the life is something we already participate in. That's the eschatological horizon. That's the that's the that's the the triumph of all things in 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 Christ risen from the dead, and we already participate in that, especially in the Eucharist, uh, which is already you know a, a promise of the future. Of the future fulfillment but but the, along the way if we keep focusing on the fact that jesus is the truth what he speaks to us we may not like it all the time but what he says to us is the truth and it is life and i would just offer you as a way of kind of getting into the word life uh as newman said life you know movement is a sign of life um he wasn't the first one to say that but it's important that he said it um i, I would i would link life to charity uh and i haven't talked about it a lot here but charity you know, we, we have so we have so impoverished that word in the modern vocabulary. For Augustine, charity is the great love of the Holy Spirit poured out into our hearts. And that's what moves us. And that's the life of the church. That's the life of the church, because we already share in, the, in that by the gift of the of the Spirit poured out, which is the personal gift of Jesus who breathes the Spirit into us. But think about those things. The truth, Jesus is the truth. You know, he is the word. Um, but the Spirit is the life in the sense that the fullness of charity comes to us through it. And maybe we need to, one of the things we can do, and maybe I'll try to do this next week a little bit, um, is, is to unpack the depth of what Augustine and so much of the, of the, of the great mystical tradition and, 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 and evangelical tradition of the church, what we mean by the word charity, which is the life. It's the outpouring of the spirit in us. And that's what moves us. That's what gets us anywhere. Without love, you don't move. This is, this is the great anthropological truth of Augustine and so many others. You know, if all you've got is the truth, you're just going to sit there and stare at it. Whereas if you have the truth and the life, then you have the love of God moving you and you move with it. This is the thing. You know, if it doesn't move you, what, what good is it? That's what I would say there. Thank you, Bishop Flores, for joining us again for this second part um, in your reflection on John 14, St. Augustine, and Synodality. We will be meeting again on Tuesday, March 19th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time. And um, I thank you for answering your questions, being with us, uh, guiding us, and shepherding us in the Synodal path. Um, so with that, uh, we, it's four o'clock on the dot here uh, in DC. So if I can just invite you to close us in prayer as we yes. leave to reflect on what you've shared with us. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you. And all of you who's spent this hour with us, let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, by the generosity of your heart, you have 
given us the gift of your son, who has become our way, it leads us back to you. We ask that the generous outpouring of the Holy Spirit might enlighten our minds and move our hearts to seek those things in our time, in our in our world, in our circumstances that reflect the goodness of your son and the way that leads to life. We ask that we might be instruments uh, by, by, by sharing in the grace which he offers us and that we might hear more clearly his voice speaking to us through the gospels. For as Augustus says, even though we not, not do not hear the sound, we ask that we might have the grace to perceive the sense within our hearts. We ask for this grace and a blessing upon us all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all very much. It's been great. Thank you. And this meeting was recorded and we will share it uh, when it is ready. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon, evening, day. Bye.